Welcome to this podcast from the Clinical Knowledge Service. In this second podcast on anaphylactic reactions, possible treatments for patients who have acute, ongoing risks are covered. If you want to know how to identify anaphylactic reactions in an emergency situation, please download the first podcast on this subject from the CKS site. My name is Joe Unsworth. I'm based at Southmead Hospital, Bristol. I'm a consultant physician with an interest in immunology and allergy. How are the patients with anaphylaxis generally investigated? Well, that's where people like me come in. Um, So after successful resuscitation, it's, it's important from a preventative viewpoint that these patients are seen and evaluated with a view to making sure this doesn't happen again. In other words, to try and identify trigger factors in certain circumstances this will be blatantly obvious so for example somebody who's received an infusion of penicillin on the ward and nearly dropped down dead within minutes of the drug entering the bloodstream but that would be an exception very often the trigger factor is not at all clear the key really is taking a detailed careful history with particular regard to timing and patterns of events so for example Somebody who goes to bed perfectly well and wakes up in the middle of the night with what appears to be anaphylaxis, it's unlikely that that's due to an external trigger because it's several several hours since they ate or drank anything, for example. It may be they took a medicine in the night. Um, so the, the clinical history is the important thing. There, There is one investigation that's very useful during the acute setting and that's something called a mast cell triptase which is a blood test which is only abnormal transiently during anaphylaxis. In other words the the blood sample has to be taken within a few hours of the anaphylactic event because the the factor which is measured this mast cell triptase protein will only last several hours so we recommend a sample within an hour or so of presentation, a second sample a couple of hours after that if possible, and then a a third and final sample is organised the next day when everything's settled back to normal, and that gives a baseline. So is that something which a primary care physician should be thinking about taking? I think it's worth doing for for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I stress it's only... Uh, just it's only worthwhile if you can get the acute sample so if the patients come to see you several hours after the problem began then it's probably too late but it is useful because the differential diagnosis of suspected anaphylaxis is wide ranging from uh, vasovagal attacks through to panic attacks through to genuine anaphylaxis so in the face for example of clear-cut positive results somebody in whom anaphylaxis had previously been doubted really needs to be taken very seriously and and vice versa perhaps. In the follow-up setting there are tests that one one can request so for example if the suspicion is of shellfish allergy there are blood tests and skin scratch tests these look for IgE antibody and they can be organized but but really I I should make it clear that the key investigation the key tool is to take a careful history so to give one other common example if somebody has been suffering with an urticarial rash and bad angioedema for several weeks on a daily basis that is unlikely to be anaphylaxis because anaphylaxis is a is a sudden precipitous life-threatening event which is quick to come on and usually quick to resolve with successful treatment If patients are coming to the emergency department with anaphylaxis, how quickly can they go home? If you've had clear-cut anaphylaxis requiring adrenaline, it's probably advisable for the patient to be detained overnight to make sure that late adverse events don't happen and, and also to make sure that when they do happen they can be properly treated. So in an ideal world, anybody who's required adrenaline probably should be kept overnight. Often in practice, people are sent home the same day, but I think that's a a judgment call by the medical staff present at the time, and they'd have to be very sure and very confident that the reaction is fully resolved. So therefore, if someone has already had their auto-injector, should they automatically be admitted? 
Not necessarily. It, it, it really depends on whether the auto-injector was used... If, if we imagine the community setting and the patient making the judgment themselves as to whether or not it was correct to give the medicine at that time, then in the real world, with patients having limited understanding sometimes and also being frankly unsure of whether they should or shouldn't give it, 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 it is very commonplace that adrenaline is given under circumstances where arguably with the eye of retrospect and with, and with a more expert judgment, it didn't need to be given. So I don't think it's right to say that as a knee-jerk um, protocol, any patient who, who self-administers adrenaline therefore must be admitted. One would have to evaluate each one on their merits. But perhaps a, a safe, sensible middle ground would be, the, would be that they go to see their GP or go to their local A&E for evaluation. You know, they could have measurements of blood pressure and other parameters just to check how they are. And how do you decide whether someone should be prescribed an adrenaline auto-injector in the first, first place? Well, this, this is a difficult question and, and a controversial question. And over the years, opinions have, have chopped and changed somewhat. So suffice to say that there are differences of opinion. Let, let, let me give an example. If you took the issue of children with proven nut allergy... And this is now quite a common phenomenon. Let's say it's 1% of the population. It may be higher than that, 1% of the pediatric population. This is a lot of children. There are experts who can give um, reasonably good arguments for why every single one of those children should be given adrenaline auto-injectors for, for home use as required. Not everybody agrees with that. Um, At the other end of the spectrum, there are particular high-risk groups where it's almost universally agreed that that patients, and particularly children in this example, ought to have an adrenaline. So, for example, if you had both nut allergy and brittle asthma, asthma that's requiring daily uh, steroid inhalers, they're a group which are far more at risk and it is generally agreed that they should have, have adrenaline pens. The, there is another factor here in, in, in the debate, which is the risk-benefit of, a, of an, ad, an adrenaline prescription. Now, in children, by and large, the risks of adrenaline, even if it were to be self-administered inappropriately in a panic measure where perhaps a parent was concerned, but it actually was not anaphylaxis. So with every good intention, the, the adrenaline was administered. It's unlikely... that that a child would come to any harm. And if it was administered to a child who was actually having a bad asthma attack, it would only do good. But the situation is different in adults, particularly in the elderly, particularly where where, where the patients are arteriopaths who've had angina, arrhythmias and so on, where adrenaline carries a far higher risk profile. Now, that's not to say that arteriopaths should never be given adrenaline, but it is to say that there is a consideration there in terms of the likely benefits and risks, and that relates both to patients' understanding of their condition, patients' ability to judge a situation appropriately, and so on, which the general practitioner will be best placed to judge. In addition, there, there are... There are examples where people have been given adrenaline syringes where it would, it would be widely agreed that the prescription was a mistake. So, for example, if you take urticaria or nettle rash, which is a cardinal feature of anaphylaxis, it's common in, in the majority of cases, it's also true that 95% of people who go to see their GP or the emergency physician with a nasty urticaria rash do not have anaphylaxis so it's a complicated area it, it, it depends on judging the clinical situation appropriate in the first instance so for example it needs it requires the, the GP to make a judgment on whether this patient has ever had anaphylaxis or has a condition which could lead them to have anaphylaxis and whether they've been trained in when to use an adrenaline pen 
when not to use it. Often the, the, the advice is to give a written management plan. This may, re, may be best done by referring to the local allergy clinic where the specialist nurse, for example, could go, go through it with them. All that counterbalanced against the risks of adrenaline. So what does the patient need to know if they are diagnosed as having anaphylaxis? If after sensible consideration the patient has been prescribed adrenaline for home use, then there are several follow-on requirements. Firstly, there's no point them having the medicine unless they carry it with them at all times. Secondly, it needs to be in date. So every couple of years, these will need to be changed for a new prescription. Thirdly, the patient needs to know how to use it and when to use it, and that's, that's easier said than done. And studies have been done which evaluate these simple criteria and show that if you take a 100 patients who've been prescribed adrenaline, only one in three, only 30% or so, actually know how to use it and use it at the right time and carry it with them and have a prescription which, which is in date. So often it occurs to me that prescribing an adrenaline syringe in many cases is treating the doctor rather than the patient because the, the patient goes away happy. The patient, the, the, the GP or the doctor feels that they've done their bit but actually the vast majority we know will fail to comply with the prescription properly. And then even in the acute situation, if adrenaline were used, there are examples where it doesn't work. Uh, it's the best measure we have, and it's agreed to be a sensible measure in patients vulnerable to uh, anaphylaxis in the future. So in summary, there is perhaps um, a lot of concern amongst members of the public and amongst perhaps primary care physicians about the growing incidence of anaphylaxis. Is that something that people should be concerned about or not? In a general sense, yes. I mean, allergic disease can be potentially fatal. But I think the concern should be directed at the, at the end of the spectrum where the risks are highest. So it's in patients with asthma, for example, especially in patients with poorly controlled asthma. And in addition to giving them adrenaline, arguably you should be spending a lot of time reviewing them, making sure their asthma is well controlled, and so on and so on. There, there are other parallel factors. So, for example, a patient with hypertension, you should take them off a beta blocker and put them on an alternative because a beta blocker will frustrate adrenaline in a situation where it was used as an emergency rescue medicine. So there's a whole package, really. The bottom line is that where it's difficult to make a clear-cut decision, the GP always has the option of referring to their local specialist allergy centre. Dr Joe Unsworth, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.